So I, I actually, I'm stoked today. I'm blessed today. Uh, about four years ago, I met this young man who uh, he came into my life kind of like a bowling ball. Uh, he has a personality kind of like a bowling ball. His, the first thing he did, he was 13 years old, and he tried picking a fight with me. Straight up. And I was, at that point in time, I wasn't an old fat guy. And, and so I, I, kind of, I kind of thumped on him a little bit. Um, because I knew he was only 13, so I couldn't thump on him too much because he was a minor. Um, no, I, I, just, I just loved the tenacity in this boy. And I loved his vision, and I loved the fact that no matter what hand life deals out to you, you can turn around and say, you know what, God's got plans for my life. And that day, or that week at camp, uh, the Holy Spirit put a call of ministry upon this young man's life, and I was able to be the one that he talked with afterwards about this. The next year, next year, brought you in as an intern? It would have been two years later. Two years later, I brought him in as a summer intern. Uh, he found out real quick that we don't pay interns near enough and we work them way too hard. Uh, he has not been back as an intern since. Uh, no, we, on, on a very serious note, one thing Impact's always tried to do is bless the tar out of our interns. And we have a board that's gr very generous and has done that, so we were able to do that. But Eli has had this calling. He works with our youth. And uh, this month when I'm in sessions, I was like, you know what? Eli, the time has come. And I really want you to be able to bring forward what God's given you. And so uh, if you guys could give a big round to Eli Jones as he comes up. I'll grab it. And so uh, this will be his first time preaching in front of the church. And so hold the, uh, like the cantaloupe and melons until the end if you're going to throw them. Um, but no, on a serious note, uh, I know he hears from God. I know he's been preparing. He was supposed to preach last week, and with, with the snow and stuff, I said, you get an extra week of prayer. Uh, but it's, it's going to be good. So, uh, Eli, thank you, brother. And uh, if, if you need bailed out, we're here for you. So before I get too crazy, um, someone decided to come all the way just to watch me, and I was like, well, i got to point her out. Will you stand up, Mom? Everyone turn and look and wave. That's my mom. Yeah, that's my mom. She's the one that drug me to church every Sunday, even when I didn't want to. Even when I didn't want to. Yeah, it was tough, but I was there every Sunday, and that's probably why I'm here today. So thanks, Mom. I love you. Today we're going to talk about the heart of a father, which in this case is going to get really deep, so bear with me. In Genesis 126, it says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let him have dominion. Now, I get two different things out of that. Um, I get the heart of our Father right away, is to have true relationship and be in alignment with us in our lives. That's, that's what he says in being in our image and in, our, in his likeness. He wants us to have a relationship and be in alignment with God. But the reason you exist, or the, the reason you exist is the purpose. It's for the purpose you're here. And that's when he says, have dominion, which dominion also means authority. So when God says, <coughs> likeness, have our likeness, and live like him, oh my. <coughs> Bear with me. In our likeness and let him have dominion, he's, he's giving us authority. See, we were created to be kings and advance the territory of God rather than be slaves to freedom, which <laughs> um, we were sitting there doing way, singing the song Waymaker, and that hit really hard to me because when Jesus came, he came as an example. He came out as an example and as a king to advance the territory of God. And ultimately, he gave us freedom, and that's what we look at it as. And now we're slaves to that freedom because we're like, oh, we're free. God, God paid the price for us. But that's not why he came. He came so we could advance the kingdom of God, be ambassadors. An ambassador, an ambassador 
represents, it's a pure reflection. When we're ambassadors of Christ, we're a pure reflection of what, of what God is. So when God says, be in our likeness and have dominion, we are to be an ambassadors, a pure reflection of God. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces, and with no veil will we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level to level of glory to another. And this glory tran- transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. <laughs> um, and that leads to Reformation. And the definition of Reformation is to put, your, to put or change into an improved form or condition. To cause to, to cause to abandon evil ways, we are we are called to reform atmospheres, cultures, territories, and things. That's what we. That's that's the dominion. That's the authority we are given by God. I will. I just got to get there. Um, here I don't have what verse it is because I messed up but it says I tell you this truth the person who follows me in faith believing me will do the same mighty miracles that I do even greater miracles than these because I go to be with my father for I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name and that is how the son will show what the father is really like and bring glory to him Ask me in my name, and I will do it for you. Loving me empowers you to obey my commands. That's that's everything I want to say right there. Um, He came here as an example. He came here as an example to show us that was him making the way. See, he already made the way. The way has already been walked. He showed us the example on how to live. (laughs) Even greater miracles than these, because I go to be with my Father. And since God freely offered His Son as a sacrifice for all of us, He certainly wouldn't withhold us from anything else He has to give. Romans 8.32 so in being an ambassador of Christ, a true reflection of God, he gave you the authority not to rule over people, but to rule over atmospheres, cultures, territories, and things. Because in saying you have dominion and authority over this world, it's not saying people, because if you've ever tried to tell someone what to do, it doesn't work out great, unless you're told to preach on a Sunday. In that case, it worked. He had the authority over me. It's like, I don't want to do it this week. It's up to you. <laughs> but <laughs> but, it, but it's in that order, specifically, that we have the authority to, go, to rule over atmospheres, cultures, and territories, and I'm going to break those all down for you. Atmosphere, the definition of atmosphere is the pervading tone or mood of a place situation or work of art when we as sons of the king bring atmosphere we are providing a tone of everything that the father's heart is okay atmosphere the pervading tone or mood of a place situation or work of art when we as sons of the king bring atmosphere we bring the pervading tone of everything that the 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 father's heart is so bringing atmosphere it's coming to church on Sunday, but it's also everywhere you go. The, the atmosphere you bring goes right into creating culture. And the definition of culture is to maintain conditions suitable for growth, creating a new normal. When the atmosphere you bring becomes a habit, a culture is created. So... 
church in general, this church, I feel strongly, we're stuck in just an atmosphere. And we're ready for culture. We're ready to bring a culture. Um, an example of this. When I think, I was thinking all this last week, luckily, because we were snowed in, and I just got to think about all this. And I thought about the founding fathers to America. They came with an atmosphere of change. To be independent, to be free. They brought that. They brought that atmosphere. But then they sat down, and they're like, well, let's make the Declaration of Independence. And they created a culture right there. And that leads to culture without atmosphere and culture you can't take over territory so when they sat down and wrote the independence the declaration of independence that's when they stepped right into taking territory which which we have authority over too and the definition of territory is an area of land under the jurisdiction of a ruler or state the atmosphere we make a habit becomes culture and culture influences the territory territory reflects the laws or ruler of that territory. So if we bring the atmosphere of everything that Christ is, then we created a culture of Christ, which then takes over the territory and makes him king over that territory. So I have to go further into that, into our founding fathers doing that, because they created and they took over territory. America, what we call freedom today, and us as Christians and what the church does, we've lost grasp of authority. <laughs> we, let, we let everyone else take over the atmosphere and bring in a new culture and take over the territory of what we call today America. And that's why every Sunday we talk about government. <laughs> So, when God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let him have dominion, we got, we got that we're in his image and in his likeness down. But it's time that we take our authority and bring a new atmosphere and create a new culture to take over this territory that we live in. Because nothing's going to change until we go take it. Because it's ours. In Luke 10, 20, it says, However, your real source of joy isn't merely that these spirits submit to your authority, but that your names are written in the journals of heaven and that you belong to the kingdom, to God's kingdom. That is the true source of your authority. So and until you're in true alignment with God, you're never going to have authority over anything. So it all starts there. I think we're pretty close. And I think we've brought, started to bring a real atmosphere, but I'm ready. I'm ready to take over a culture, create a new culture, and break into territory. And that means out of here. Because we've created a culture and a territory here. We've done a good job. We've got a great church territory. But it's time to Time to take territory over it all. That went really fast. <laughs> I just want to close in prayer, I guess. Lord, Thank you. Thank you for bringing us an example. Thank you for giving this church your heart, Lord. Lord, I pray right now that as we walk into the authority of atmosphere, culture, and territory, that you would just bless us with confidence to walk out in that. 
I pray right now that as we walk out of here, we bring our atmosphere everywhere and we create the culture in Wheatland. We create a culture in Wyoming. We create a new culture in, in, in America, Lord. And reface what this territory is supposed to look like. Praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name. Perfect. Okay. Um, so we've got a few minutes. First of all, come on. Come on. That was, I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow a dub colloquialism. That's some heavy revy. Um, I stole it all from him. <laughs> no. No, this is good, you guys. This is, uh, so one of the things I think is so incredibly important, we're going to get another wireless mic, and Charity's going to join us up here, um, and we're going to do a little bit of a panel. Uh, atmosphere is huge. We've talked about that. And I think the, the problem that we've had is we've had a mental, a mental block that says we can't control anything. We are, in, we are controlled by everything in, as humans. Does that make sense? Where I have Christ inside of me. I have the power of Christ inside of me. Hence, when I step into a place, I have the atmosphere of whom? Christ. So I have the power of I have the power of God in my life. Amen. How many people agree with that concept? You have the power of God in your life. Okay. So that's the atmosphere bit. So I want to just take and I want to bring up a concept. So you've said that you felt like we are understanding the concept of atmosphere but we're not changing culture. So let me ask this question, what does it take to shift an atmosphere and go from shifting an atmosphere into creating a culture. What do you think is uh, missing that is keeping us from being able to do that? I think what's missing is <coughs> taking it everywhere you go rather than places. It's really easy to come to church on Sunday and live the way you think you need to live and bring that, bring, walk in that atmosphere here but when you go to work on Monday or you go say even to your family's house on the weekend for a barbecue that and you're the only one that believes in God it's really hard to walk into a place like that that has such a such a strong right and strong atmosphere already over that place walking into an atmosphere and changing it it takes a lot but it starts with doing it all the time, everywhere you go. Charity? I guess just to re reiterate that um, how we create a culture is to make the atmosphere we bring a habit. So, like, for instance, the culture of healing. Healing is not a habit in this place. That's not a culture that we've created here. Um, whereas, like, if you were to go to somewhere in Africa and you were to heal someone they pick up that, that atmosphere, that atmosphere of healing, and it becomes a habit because they see that and they're saying, we want that here. We want that as a culture. And we don't have that situation here in the way that people want to adopt that atmosphere because of how powerful it is. You know, that atmosphere needs to become such a habit here that when people walk in, they're like, wow, this culture, though, you know, this, this culture of honor. I think we've created a very good culture of honor in this place. But have we created a culture of healing here? Have we created a culture of signs and wonders here? Excellent. I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, and so with that, the culture is needed. Obviously, the atmosphere. And, and you have to understand, three years ago, we didn't have an idea about any of this. We didn't even, I mean, subconsciously maybe, but not consciously. Uh, and, and so I'm going to give one example real quick that when I first started understanding that you can shift atmospheres when you walk into places. I had a, I had a board meeting one time on a, on a secular board, and I walked into that meeting, and, and I, there was an oppression in the place. 
And I said, no, 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 no. I will shift the atmosphere in this place because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And I know the power that I possess. And so I walked in there with the attitude, I will be the most powerful person in this place because of the authority that has been resting upon me. So that is bringing that atmosphere outside of the four walls of the church. And it was amazing what happened. We had had a really tense time in this board because we were dealing with some issues. And I was like, you know what? The enemy is wreaking havoc here. But instead, what happened is I turned and I walked into that place, shifted the atmosphere. And I had an individual afterwards like, man, I was really dreading this meeting, but it was awesome. Why? Because I chose to say, you know what? We're going to shift the attitude in this place. We're going to shift the atmosphere. How, how many married people in the house? Okay, how many times have you ever been in a position where you're like, you know what? We were really good, now it's not good, right? How many people, and it's, it feels like that. Uh, how, how many have ever heard, uh, he said that, then the fight started? <laughs> right? That's an af atmosphere shift. Boom, you went from in communion with your spouse to an opposition to your spouse. And you might be like, oh, never. Yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it's that battle. It's that strife. That's atmosphere shift. Think about that only in a positive light. Okay, so now atmosphere to culture. Culture, we've talked about it before. I preached on it. Culture is the requirement for change because the culture will always eat the vision for lunch. I'll say it again. Your culture will always eat your vision for lunch. I could say the vision is signs and wonders, but the culture is go to the doctor. Go to the doctor is going to win. Why? Because that's our culture. So how do we go from, we've done atmosphere, culture. Once we create a culture, how does that have an effect on the territory? So in a, in a natural sense, the territory we live in is a, a cowboy culture, okay? So that means we farm, we ranch, we're Western. That's a cowboy culture. And in the same way you create a culture, it'll affect the territory around you. So if we create a culture that is Christ, everything he is and has, then we create a territory where he is king. So breaking that down, that's no longer, um, so a kingdom reflects the king, right? So what would that culture look like if the king of this territory was King Jesus? We'll never know what that looks like until we're living the culture that Jesus lived. We're never going to start gaining the territory like Jesus did until we start living the culture that Jesus brought. Because when Jesus brought an atmosphere and no one knew his name and he went and picked out the disciples, he quickly created a culture. I mean, you take Peter on the boat and he just makes a bunch of fish show up in his net. Peter's like, whoa. Whoa culture of miracles is now and I believe it because he saw it with his eyes so until you create that culture by seeing it believing it you'll you'll never walk like Jesus did but you have to do everything it's not just honoring healing it's it's all of it together honoring miracles signs and wonders it's all together you can't buy a culture legislate a culture You only can create a culture. And that's something to be, because this is it. How many people, we're in a microwave generation and a microwave society. I want it now. You know what? Maybe if we got started another program, we'll create a culture. No. I, I had to laugh. I, I mean, I, I sit in, in a congressional mode. I, I'm a legislator. And you want to know something? There's, there's this overwhelming desire for us to fix the problem there. But you want to know where the problem will be fixed? Here. The government wants to fix from the top down, but it really needs to fix from the bottom up. That's how government works. And, and I, that's not a popular stand, just so you're aware. But you know what? You can't legislate a culture change. You can't legislate honor in a, in a society. You couldn't legislate people to love each other. You create a culture of honor and respect and love, and out of that, you will get a territory that emulates honor, love, and respect. 
That's it. The most powerful thing in the entire universe is when people understand who they are. Romans 8. Understand who I am, what I've been called to do, and how I'm called to move forward. So atmosphere is everything about what we do with Christ inside of us. Culture is what we create when we live that daily. And territory is what is taken when the culture overruns the prior culture. So we have a culture of, of poverty in Black County. What's it going to look like whenever we say, you know what, uh-uh. We have a culture of wealth because of who Christ is, and we will build sustainable wealth in this territory through businesses that are based in biblical-minded, kingdom-based entrepreneurs who say, you know what, we won't be a po impoverished territory. We will be a rich territory because we refuse to partner with a poverty mentality. And now all of a sudden, Platte County goes from being always poor to being independently wealthy why? Because the kingdom of God advanced economics. Do you see how this works? You know what? We have a school system that isn't working like it's supposed to work. Well, guess what? When the entire school board has godly, Bible-believing Christians sitting on that board saying, we will advance a godly way of educating our children, all of a sudden it's not about a lack of money anymore or a lack of good curriculum or this or that or the other, we're actually advancing the kingdom of God through the education of our children. Well, then you go back to, so how was Jesus' atmosphere, how did it become culture? You look at it, and people, as soon as those miracles started happening, as soon as he started bringing that atmosphere, people started anticipating. Am I right, Elena? Anticipating? So they're like, if we go and see Jesus... I'm going to get healed. If we go and see Jesus, my daughter's going to get raised from the dead. That anticipation created that culture because that, that atmosphere that Jesus brought, that healing atmosphere, that loving atmosphere, that providing atmosphere, it became a habit. It became the culture of that land. Do you have anything to add to that? We're getting on a tie right now. I, I get on a soapbox on this topic. So, But um, thank you for bringing – how many people know this is a very heavy topic? Uh, I don't know many 19-year-olds who would drop that one. So good job. <laughs> I mean, just saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this is – you guys, I, I want to take and I want to I talk about culture for a second. There's been a culture in church that says – I'm the pastor, hence you can't be fed by anyone but me. And that is the most detrimental and destroying culture that the church has ever created. Know why? Because that requires me to always be at the center of your feeding. Forty inches of snow, we've got a lot of hungry animals right now. And you have to supplemental feed. What would happen if you supplemental fed those animals even after the snow left? What would, what would you create? <laughs> big animals. You would create a dependence upon you to feed them. How many people know that when you first get a baby, you need to make sure they get fed, but after a while, you're like, you know what, you're going to have to figure out how to eat something other than this. You're going to have to figure out how to fend for yourself. And so we create an independence instead of a dependence. And so how cool is it whenever we can free you to actually get from God apart from us? Amen? Amen. And so one of the other aspects of that is that a very wise man in my life, a mentor in my life, say, Jeremy, always replace or train your replacement. And you will do one of two things. You will either be replaced or you'll be multiplied. That's something I'm adding in. I wasn't told that, but I'm seeing that. So what do I just see? I see someone who can hear from the Holy Spirit, who can put together a concept that is incredibly deep and explain it to a congregation with the encouragement to get up off your rear end and do something. Good job. And say, you know what? I won't allow you to be stuck because you're called to advance. So what does this look like? This looks like, you know what? Who says that we can't have another branch of impact somewhere else? Who says that we don't have a staff pastor in the making? 
Every single day we should be saying, God, who's next? I, guys, we need a drummer. Who's next? Hey, we need, a, we need another lead singer. Who's next? Who are we going to raise up? How are we going to take the next generation and instill in them a tenacity that says, you know what, we got it? Casey, one of the things I love about you is I have never seen you back off a fight. Ever. Ever. He's like, do you know how to build that? No, but we're going to figure it out. Do you know how to fix that? No, but we'll get her figured out. I asked him, Casey, do you think I should build a house? Yep. <laughs> okay. Why? Because why not? You'll be defined, you guys. You'll be defined by what you chose to do or what you chose not to do. And you will have regret about one of those choices. And I promise your regret will not be about what you chose to do. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's the hardest thing. I look at the church in America today, and it's like everyone's begging for God to come save them and change the world. But he already changed the world when he sent Jesus. You know? Wow. So it's time for us to that's, walk in. Yeah, that. that's that slave to freedom concept right, right. there. Because kings seek, they, they take territory, and, and slaves are just happy that there's no longer chains. We're sitting in freedom. We're sitting here watching the world change. But rather, we need to be advancing the kingdom. Because it's on our shoulders. Because God gifted that to us. Sometimes it's hard to see it as a gift because it'd be like, wow, well, it'd be nice if you could just fix it all, but it's up to us. He wants to see us shine in that, shine in his glory. Amen. Let's, let's wrap this up. Okay. God, we, we uh, understand a calling. God, there's, there's been a lot, <clears throat> a lot given to us today. And God, we... We carry the atmosphere of you. We carry your presence in our lives and your power in our lives, God. And as we do that, we can walk into situations and we can change cultures. And God, when we change cultures, the culture then changes the territory. And God, the best part is this. You did not call us to be observers. You called us to be players. You wanted partnership. And that's so mind-boggling, God, because we can look at all the reasons why we don't qualify, but you sit there and say, no, 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 wait a second. You do qualify because I'm in you. I'm with you. I'm equipping you. And God, that is so amazing because you do not leave us and say, you know what, watch while I do this. No, you say, you know what, I came equipped. You do it. You don't like it? Fix it. And God, as we do that, the world will never be the same. And furthermore, we'll never be able to complain about it because it's on our shoulders. So God, I thank you for Eli and his willingness to, to saddle up to an incredibly difficult subject and probably bring more reality to this subject than this church has ever seen. I thank you for that obedience. I thank you for his ability to listen to your presence and say, you know what, to understand the Father's heart for the job for us is the most powerful and important thing. And God, I pray that you would continue to speak to him, use him, equip him to be able to go and change this world. God, there are, there are young men like Eli that give me hope for the future. And we have them spread all over this place, amazing men and women who say, you know what? Ha, watch this. Watch this. God, I pray that we would never tell people what they can't do. Because, God, if they don't know they can't do it, then they'll probably do it. And that's powerful. So, God, we thank you and praise you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So